Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. We thank you for your constant mercies. We pray now as we open our hearts and minds to you that you will teach us the lessons that ancient Israel should have understood. Help us to understand them now. May we see that you lifted up a church, a church in the wilderness, and we are now the church in the full blaze of the light of Jesus Christ. We pray that we may understand your plan of salvation, that we may present it to others, that we may be faithful witnesses, that we may truly live the Christian life. Help us now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Last time we began the basic elements of the sanctuary. I'm going to review just a little bit so we're all together. The center of the sanctuary in the wilderness is that little square, the most holy place. Okay? That is the center of the camp of Israel. They are 2,000 cubits away in every direction. That's about two-thirds of a mile each way. So that gives you about a mile and a half in each direction. Or, or a mile and a half square. All right, so... That's the center of the camp. That's the center of the plan of salvation. But it's the center of the plan of salvation symbolically in heaven because this square on the west side represents heaven. So everything in this square is, is happening in heaven. Everything on the east side, the east square, is happening on earth. And earth has the center of plan of salvation also. The center of the plan of salvation is a brazen altar. This altar represents the cross. That's where the sacrifice was burned. That's where everything really took place. So we have two centers of the plan of salvation. One on earth and one in heaven. That is a very important fact to begin with because most people think that everything happened at the cross. Well, everything concerning the sacrifice happened at the cross. But Jesus' ministry is not at the cross. His ministry is in heaven. And it takes both the sacrifice and the high priestly ministry to make the plan work. All right, so... The sanctuary itself, physically, you remember, had a wall around it. A wall made out of fine linen, white linen. And those linen were supported by pillars. Okay? The, the white linen was five cubits, which is nine feet. So you had these nine-foot squares all around the sanctuary. Now what did white represent? Purity. Righteousness, purity, holiness. And they were nine feet tall. So the very first lesson you get in looking at the sanctuary and its environment, the court, is that you have no way to get in there. You can't jump over nine feet. <laughs> holiness is a barrier to human beings they can't get in we have no equipment to get inside of the plan of salvation by ourselves it does have an entrance however at the east side and that entrance was made up of four veils You remember the colors? Blue, red, scarlet red, 
purple and white. Those were the four colors of the threads in the veil. And we found that those colors represented something. They were symbols, those threads. The blue represented obedience to the law of God. We found that in Numbers where it says that God, in Numbers 14, told the children of Israel to put fringes of blue on the borders of their garments. So they had blue fringes, and they had a blue fringe around the bottom of their robe, so that no matter what they did, if they used this hand, the law was there. If they used this hand, the law was there. They couldn't move their feet outside of the law. Okay? And so they were taught to always be obedient to the law of God. In Numbers 15:40, it says, Look at these fringes so that you will remember the commandments of God and do them. Now that's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? That God expects us to keep his commandments. <laughs> he said, do them. Well, you know, the whole human race, at least the parts that I have heard in their natural thinking say, you can't keep the commandments. Nobody can keep the commandments. Well, it's true that no person outside of Jesus can keep the commandments. But why did Jesus say, if you love me, keep my commandments? <laughs> there must be somebody who can keep the commandments. God said, do them. And Jesus said, if you love me, you do them. Well, that's just two scriptures. The Bible is full of the idea. Obey and live. Okay? Now, it is also true that obey and live is the old covenant. It's a covenant that God made, first of all, with beings that could obey and live. That's the angels. They obey and live. They always have. And the unfallen worlds, they obey and live. But on earth, with sinful man, no human can obey and live. Why not? Because we're all sons of Adam. We can't obey. We've lost the ability to obey. We're sinners. So the old covenant does not work with sinners. <laughs> it cannot be kept by sinners. It's impossible. So when Israel said, we will obey, we will obey. They did it three times to God. We will obey. God was waiting for them to realize you can't obey <laughs> by yourself. And so they didn't give God a chance to explain this because they told Moses, Moses, it's too terrible to be around God. Tell him to go away. We'll talk to you, but tell God to go away. See? And when they did that, they lost the ability to hear God say, I will make a new covenant with you. The old one doesn't work with you. <laughs> but they didn't give him a chance, so he said to them, Exodus 24, uh, 25, 8, make me a sanctuary that I can at least live in your neighborhood. And so God, in a very pathetic place, says, if you won't let me live in your hearts, at least make me a place where I can be close to you. <laughs> and so that's what the sanctuary is for, so God can be there to introduce them to the idea of how salvation is going to work. Once they understand they need it, <laughs> which they were starting to understand, <laughs> And in Jeremiah 31, 31 and 32, God says, I will make a new covenant with you, one that works for you. I will put my law in your heart. 
See, as a natural being, you don't have that. But I will put it in there in the new covenant because Jesus will earn the right to do that with you. And so the new covenant is the only hope a sinner has. <laughs> but don't get the idea the old covenant was for the Jews and the new covenant was for Christians. That's not in the Bible. That's what the evangelical churches have made up. And they really believe that, but it's not in the Bible. Paul is very clear that you're not a Jew because you were born one. You're a Jew when you receive Jesus. He's very clear. All right, we won't, won't stay on the covenant ideas. We've covered some of that. What I want to get to now is that the only way in to the plan of salvation is through that veil. And the blue is obedience to the law of God. Red, first thing we think of is blood. <laughs> okay? And that has to do with humanity. We'll talk more about that as we go through. When you were in kindergarten, they had you mix colors to see how it works. They gave you some primary colors and told you, well, mix these two together, see what you get. When you mixed red and blue together, what did you get? You got purple. That's the next color. Obedience. In humanity, perfect obedience in humanity makes a priest. Royalty. And the white, of course, is righteousness. So when you put all those threads together, it must have been a beautiful veil, beautiful curtain. That was hung on the pillars. Five pillars. That means the veil was pierced five times. to hang there. What did that veil represent? All right. The veil represented Jesus. He came in the veil of the flesh, Rome, uh, Hebrews tells us. Okay? So that veil is Jesus. He is the only way to get in to the plan of salvation. How many times has Jesus pierced? <laughs> Both hands, two feet, and on the side. He's the curtain. <laughs> All right, remember, we're reviewing right now. We're, <laughs> we're trying to get to where we can go into today's subject. There were 60 pillars around the chamber of the king. And you'll find that over in Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 7, I believe, where it says there were 60 valiant men around the chamber of the king. These are the people who uphold the plan of salvation and make sure it stays righteous. Okay? It stays pure. It stays holy. None of this Believe and be saved, once saved, always saved. No, it has to stay holy and pure the way God made it. And that's why we're looking at this. As a person went in, the first thing they saw was the altar of brass, the brazen altar. It had a ramp. No steps. It had a ramp. The priests would walk up this ramp. And I believe that was for modesty because if you bound up and down steps, your skirt's going to go up and down. That ramp, they made a nice, smooth <laughs> entry up there to the outside and no problem with modesty. It had a grate on the inside. Most people don't put it there, but that's where I believe it was. 
so they could put the animals on it for burning. Okay, people think the grate was on the outside, but I don't think so. <laughs> okay, now, the next thing you would see is the brass laver. Now, I have drawn it not the way you'll see it in any pictures. I have drawn it the way I believe it was. It was on the south side. Now, the reason I believe it's on the south side because the Bible tells us something was on the north side. <laughs> and that something was the place where the sacrifices were killed. Okay? They were tied to the horn, horns of the altar on the north side there. There were four horns. Horns mean power. Okay? Here's the power of salvation. If you're going to get involved in it, you've got to be tied to the power. All right, so in the courtyard, then, we have these three elements. We move into the next part of the sanctuary, or courtyard, wherein is the sanctuary. This is the second square. You see the two squares there. The western square... There's another veil. Same four colors. It's Jesus again. You can't get in there without Jesus. There are five pillars holding the veil there. <laughs> and the number five now takes on a meaning. The number five is the number of grace. Whenever you see the number five, it means grace in God's numbering system. Abraham's name was not Abraham. <laughs> his name was Abram. But God changed his name after he was tested with Isaac. And he was successful. God added one letter to Abraham's name in the Hebrew. And that letter is He. Abraham. Abram. Letters in alphabets in all kinds of languages have numerical values. He in the Jewish language in the Hebrew has the value of five. <laughs> God added grace to Abram and turned him into Abraham. <laughs> See, all these little things are slipping by, but God has built so many details in the plan of salvation and he always follows them. They're always there if you know what you're looking for. So God added grace to Abram and turned him into Abraham. All right. So the number five, then, is grace here. That's the only way you can get into the sanctuary is through grace. Through Jesus passing through the veil. And in the holy place, which is where Christians live. They live in the holy place by faith. This is their experience holy place. Out here is where they become Christians. But here is where they live as Christians by faith. In that room on the north side was the table of showbread. Okay? We'll spend some time later discussing the details of the table of showbread, what happened there. That table of showbread was on the north side. The only thing on the north side, that table. That table represents the throne of God. Now that's a detail almost every system has missed because they think 
God was in the most holy place, and that's where Jesus went, but he didn't go there. When Jesus resurrected and he went to his father, he went to the table of showbread. That's where God was. The bread in the Hebrew is called the bread of the presence. The presence of what? <laughs> of God. <laughs> okay. So God was in the holy place when Jesus went to heaven. Then he went to the tabernacle, the sanctuary, the temple, whatever you want to call it. That's where he went to see the Father. By the way, everything in the courtyard out here on the earth side is made out of brass, which is a symbol of suffering. Everything in the other square, the western square, in the tabernacle itself is made out of wood and it's covered with gold. <laughs> so we, we're seeing some real differences. The heavenly side is gold. What does heaven, what does gold represent? You remember? Sure. All right, there, there are two things here. First of all, that gold lived in a Christian's life is called faith and love. And the only perfect faith and love there's ever been is Jesus. It represents his divinity and the wood is humanity. So in the holy place, you are never just a human. Have you ever heard people say, oh, I'm just human? <laughs> well, that's too bad because Christians are not just human. They have the gold. Jesus is in them. They participate in divinity as humans. So Christians are not just human anymore. These are things that are going by really fast in the sanctuary. These symbols just, <laughs> it's a perfect object lesson. On the other side was a golden candlestick. I'm sorry, I don't want to use that terminology. I have been reading books that use that terminology. That's not what it was. It was not a candlestick. There were no candles on it. <laughs> It's a lamp stand. So when you read those books out there that call it a candlestick, you have to twist your brain back and say, wait a minute, it wasn't a candlestick. They're just not thinking th things through here. What's the difference? Well, first of all, it didn't have candles. That's a big difference. But this was one solid piece of gold. Can you imagine that? It was one talent of gold. Well, how did it get to be a candlestick? <laughs> they didn't melt it. They didn't pour it in a mold. They annealed it. Annealing means that you take that gold and you heat it up. You, you can't melt it. You just get it, heat it up. And then you beat on it and try to get it into a shape. And it cools off and you can't do it anymore. So you have to heat it up again. <laughs> and you beat it again. <laughs> and you keep doing this until you get what you're after. Can you imagine what it took to turn a lump of gold into a lampstand with a central shaft? with three shafts coming out of that that had buds, blossoms, and fruit. <laughs> this fantastic sculpture <laughs> beaten out of a piece of gold. <laughs> I don't know who could do that today. <laughs> but God had a man that he used to do this. It came from a specific tribe. There are more lessons of that. We'll come back to these things as we recall them. Okay, so this lampstand, maybe we'll spend a little time with it here. This lampstand, at the top of it 
had bowls. And inside the bowls was oil. And inside the bowls of oil, there were wicks. <laughs> okay? And so you have something very interesting going on here. You have fire. And you have oil. And you have those wicks. What were the wicks? You know, the, the Bible doesn't say. There are certain things God doesn't tell us about. But you can go back to what the Jews did and you can find out what they did. They cut up the robes of the priests. Those <laughs> white robes. And they used those as wicks. So the wick is from a priest. And the fire is the holiness of God. A consuming fire. A consuming fire to what? Sin. To sin. The oil is the spirit of God. So it's not a candle. A candle would mess everything up. <laughs> and yet in almost every book I've ever read, it says candlesticks. Well, we really have <laughs> not looked at it. It's a lamp stand with very specific details. Okay, so now we have that lampstand. Now, I haven't gone through the other pieces of furniture to show you how it works with them yet, so you might not pick up this detail. Everything in the sanctuary has a measurement that God gave Moses to make it exactly this size, this high, made out of this material. Everything was exact except the lampstand. God didn't tell him how tall to make it. <laughs> he just said, make a lampstand out of one talent of gold. I said, well, why do you suppose God did that? How come he didn't give any measurement? He just left it up to the maker. Well, what's the lampstand for? For light. It's the only light in the sanctuary. <laughs> so God is saying here, in a very indirect way, but he's saying it. He's not going to tell anybody how much light to give. <laughs> we are to be light to our capacities. And God's not putting any measurements on it. There's another thing about this lampstand. It's made out of one talent of gold. You remember the story of the talents? The one talent man, what did he do? He buried, <laughs> he buried it, didn't he? He said, you know, if I do something wrong <laughs> and I mess up here with this talent, I'm really going to be in trouble. He'll make me come up with another one to pay it back. <laughs> so when the, the, the man came and said, what would you do with the talent I gave you? He said, well, I buried it so it would be safe when you came back. <laughs> he said, well, why would you do that? He said, well, I knew you were a hard man, and I better not mess up here. <laughs> so, and the man said, well, take it away from him. He's no good for anything. Give it to the one... <laughs> Who made more talents? <laughs> and so, you know, we all get into some strange ideas. We all went to school, and the school taught us a horrible thing. The school taught us over a series of tests of papers, whether you could regurgitate what the teacher said, whether or not you were a C student, a B student, or an A student. And they put you in a niche at school. And if you're not careful, you're still carrying that around. <laughs> so you say, well, I'm a, I'm a B plus. I never made that A style. <laughs> I'm a B plus or, or I'm a C plus. I'm just one of those people that got by. That's me. I'm a C. <laughs> but you know, God never did that to anybody. 
That's the devil. Here's why the devil did that to you in school. He said, you know, someday they might become a Christian. And when they become a Christian, I want them to believe they're a C Christian or a B Christian. I'll never be an A Christian. <laughs> See? That's the devil inside your brain telling you that. That's what you learned at school. <laughs> but there are no A, B, or C Christians. There's only pass fail. You either are a Christian or you're not a Christian. You're a hundred percent or you're nothing. <laughs> okay? That's God's way. So this one talent person goes around saying, oh, I'm one of those C Christians. I only have one talent. <laughs> And I'm not going to get out there and try to say anything to people because I won't do it very well and I'll, I'll, they'll laugh at me and I might even confuse them and I don't want to turn people away from God. I only have one talent. I'll let those ten talent people do it. <laughs> but God says, now wait a minute, wait a minute. I made that candlestick out of one candle lamp, the lampstand. I'm doing it now. The lampstand <laughs> out of one talent. And I expect my one talent people to shine. <laughs> okay. And they can just as well as anybody else. You have one talent, use your talent. <laughs> So the, the lampstand, it becomes a powerful testimony of where the light is in God's sanctuary. Now, a, a couple more interesting things here. The lampstand had that one shaft, and then it came out with three sections, and then three sections, and then three sections of buds, blossoms, and fruit. Bud, blossoms, and fruit. And then on top, the fruit. What kind of fruit was it? Almonds. <laughs> it was an almond tree. So God told him, you make an almond tree to represent the people who have one talent giving light. So here in the southern part of the sanctuary, inside, across from the, the, where God is, is this almond tree. Do you know any stories in the Bible about almond trees? <laughs> you remember when the people were getting cantankerous and they didn't want Moses to be the leader? There was a thing about Korah, Dathan, Byron, you know, the stories, the 250 priests. priests the, the people didn't know what they were doing. Uh, Korah had said, Moses, you take too much upon yourself because you're trying to be a boss to the people of God. These people are holy. <laughs> These are holy people. And so Moses didn't say a lot. He said, well, you know, the Lord told me this is my position and I'm going to do what he tells me to do. <laughs> well, you know the story. There's a big earthquake. 250 of the peop princes, the leaders, the ministers that followed Korah, Dathan, and Abiram got swallowed up. They still didn't get the picture. The people said, look what you did. You killed the people of God. <laughs> And so Moses can make an earthquake like that. <laughs> well, we get to the place where the people are murmuring and complaining and so forth. And God says, we're going to settle this. I'm going to have to show them who the real priests are in this town. It says, you bring the rod of each tribe. And you bring it over here. And then I'll tell you what to do next. So they all brought their rods. He says, okay, you stick them in here in the most holy place. You leave the ends sticking out because nobody can go in there. You stick them in there. You come back tomorrow. So the people came back the next day. 
And they had 11 dead sticks. I mean, what do you expect? <laughs> They're dead sticks. They've been dead a long time. Moses' rod was dead 40 years, at least. That was Aaron's rod. Moses gave it to him to use. All right. So when they pulled out Aaron's rod, it was no longer a dead stick. What was it? It was a living almond tree. God resurrected that stick and turned it into a living tree. And he made the point. He says, there's only one person that I'm going to count as a priest in Israel. That's a person who was dead and I have resurrected them. They have the new life. <laughs> so he proved these other tribes didn't have any claim to the priesthood because they didn't have that life or they wouldn't be asking for it. <laughs> It kind of reminds me of some people today who are asking for something God never said they should have. It has to do with ordination. All right, so this tree had a name in the Hebrew. The word, the word for almond in the Hebrew is shakad. Okay? Shakat. And that word for almond has a root meaning. That's why they named the almond Shakat. The almond tree is the first one to put forth fruit so people can see the season has started. And so the meaning of almond in the Hebrew is to hasten. Okay? To hasten. I want to read you a sentence you probably all have read or had somebody tell you about. Christ Object Lessons. Let's see. Christ Object Lessons, page 59. Let me get to it here. Where am I here? Sixty, sixty-one, maybe sixty-nine. My brain, I haven't uh, looked at that page for a while. Let me see very quickly here. Yes, it's sixty-nine. Excuse me. Better change your notes. Sixty-nine. Yeah, 59 is the voice of God. Okay, I got him now. I got to plant it back in my mind. <laughs> All right, 69. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of the Lord. <laughs> when I first saw that, I about fell off my chair. I said, look at there, how God talks through his messengers. There's the shakad. There's the lampstand. When God's people shine like Jesus, they will hasten his coming. They're the to hasten. <laughs> the sanctuary is full of these kinds of things. You have to know what you're looking at. You have to study it. You have to wait for God to show you some things. The shakad, the to hasten, the almond tree. All right, let's go back. 
Jesus, I, I'm, I'm saying this to you because it really perplexed me for a long time. I couldn't make anything out of it. Then the Lord finally had to open up my mind to see it. Jesus was the priest and the victim. At the cross, he was the priest and the offering. He was the sacrifice. And I couldn't figure out how could he be the priest and the offering all at the same time. <laughs> now, I understood that he was the high priest afterwards. That was not hard. But how could he be both at the cross? And I wrestled with that and wrestled with it and wrestled with it and I came up with nothing. And just nothing was getting through. I had no thought that would work for me. And the Lord had to finally open some brain cells and say, well, uh, what about this? <laughs> the sacrifice was 2,000 years ago. And happened one time. Jesus is a priest. For how long? Forever. Forever. After the order of Melchizedek. <laughs> he was not a priest like the other ones. Judah. He was Judah, uh, Levi, excuse me. He was a priest, Melchizedek, at the cross. Did somebody take his life away from him? You know there are people among us saying the devil killed him. The devil didn't kill Jesus. There are people saying the Jews killed him. Well, we're going to get to some better knowledge than that today. Jesus volunteered. Nobody made him die. Nobody killed him. He said, my father has given me authority to lay down my life and to take it again. When it was time in the plan of salvation, he said, father, I commend my spirit into your hands. It's finished. <laughs> yeah, nobody killed him. That's another strange thing that has crept into Christianity. Now, I'm going to show you now in the sanctuary what it was that killed him. When a person comes from the camp, now remember, there was nothing for two-thirds of a mile in any direction. So when a person came with their little animal, if they could afford an animal, you know, not everybody could afford one. <laughs> you know, there were bullocks, and there were goats, and there were lambs. There were pigeons. And a person who couldn't afford any of that they could bring a handful of flour. <laughs> God has not left anybody out of it. <laughs> but let's say this person has a lamb, and this person has done something he now realizes he shouldn't have done. Now, I want to point out something here. The sanctuary was set up by God for sins of ignorance. Sins of ignorance. There was no provision in the church of God if you willfully, knowingly rebelled against him and committed sin. What happened to people who did that? They got the rocks. That made them an effective appointment for the second resurrection. You say, boy, I'm glad I didn't live back there. Well, you know, God hasn't changed. He's still the same. Just because we don't get the rocks today doesn't mean he's different. The church, as the true church of God, cannot back sin and say, well, 
It's okay. Give it a little time and we'll bring you back. Yeah, that's what the church does today. You did this and God says, that cuts it, that breaks it. But we'll give you about three years. You come back, we'll take you back in. The sanctuary is about sins of ignorance. So this person, realizing he's done something and knowing this is a sin against God, I need, I need to be right with God. He has given me a lamb to work with. I'm going to take it down there and <laughs> be sure everything's okay. So this person comes across from way over here, across that big empty field, <laughs> scraped clean with his lamb. <laughs> and the whole camp of Israel is looking at him. <laughs> There he goes. He did something. <laughs> yeah. There are no big secrets there. Everybody's watching him going across there. <laughs> he must be serious about something. Letting all those people look at him. So here he comes. He comes over here and the priest meets him right there at the north side. And the priest looks at the animal. The priest knows something in those days that the priests today aren't too sure about. The priest knew God requires perfection. That wasn't a question in any of their minds because that's what they were to look at that animal for, to see if it had any blemishes, any problems. Got a twisted toe? Sorry, can't use it. So they looked at this animal, and in the wilderness, they hadn't figured out a way to get people to pay for a new one yet. That was in Jesus' time. That's why he called the place a, thin, a den of robbers. The priests were robbing the people, making them buy new animals, because the animal was never good enough. <laughs> but this time the animal's good enough, the priest says, okay, come on in. So he comes over here to the north side. The animal's tied up. It's tied to the power. And the person confesses. Now suppose you weigh 200 pounds and you are now going to confess your sins on this little animal. The Hebrew doesn't say that the person put his hands on. That's not what the Hebrew does. The Hebrew says he put his weight on it. You're a 200-pound animal on top of your little lamb, putting your weight on him, shoving him down. Your, weight, your sins are moving. The weight is shifting. It's coming off of you. It's going onto that animal. Now, the priest should have been the one to confess the sins on, but you can't go around killing priests. So God put animals in between. Putting the weight on the animal. The, the sin has been transferred now to that poor animal. And I say poor animal because this isn't a stranger. The way God set it up. This is an animal I raised. It's my animal. He knows me. I call him. He comes running. I feed him. I take care of him. And he knows that's how I treat him. This animal loves me. And he's wondering, what are you doing? <laughs> Putting your weight on me like that. The priest hands a knife to the person now and stretches the head of the animal towards the most holy place. And the sinner cuts the throat of the animal. And that poor animal saying, what are you doing to me? The priest catches some of the blood in a bowl because the sinner's part is done now. The priest will do everything else. 
He's going to take the blood and use it. Now, I want you to review with me for just a second what happened here. Uh, what does that animal represent? He is an innocent victim. He hasn't done anything wrong. But he has taken the sinner's sin onto himself. And now he owns it. And he's going to die for that. It's all a symbol of Jesus that all of Israel should have understood, but some of them got confused. But we need to understand what just happened. Who was that sinner that just cut the throat of the animal? It was me. It was you. You murdered God. with your own hand. But he volunteered. See, he said, you can do that to me. It's the only way I can offer you salvation. You've got to take the knife and cut my throat. So don't say the Jews are Christ killers. Don't get over on that Catholic ground, please. They're not any more Christ killers than you are because you really did it. And if you're not willing to own up to it, you will never have salvation. Amen. Jesus took it for you and you did it. He didn't do it with somebody else. You did it or you have no part in it. That's why he can become your personal savior. It's between you and him. Don't th look at the world he's saving. That doesn't count. <laughs> You're not involved in that. <laughs> but right here, you are involved. You have the knife. The priest takes the blood. And depending on the sacrifice and who the person is, Leviticus, the fourth chapter, there are four different things that happen. He either takes some of the blood and sprinkles it on the veil. He sprinkles it at the veil, not on it, but some gets on it. <laughs> that veil has got to be cleaned up once a year. The blood is in the, whole, in the sanctuary now. The sanctuary has been polluted with sin because the, the sin went from the person to the animal to the blood to the sanctuary. Now, almost every Christian body today says that when you Receive forgiveness from God. He now has forgotten your sins. They're gone forever. And that's that. That's why they teach once saved, always saved. See? But that is not what the Bible teaches. Jeremiah 17.1. The sin of Judah is erased. Is that what you read? My Bible doesn't say that. <laughs> Does it say blotted out? No, it doesn't say that. It says the sin of Judah is written. Now that is a very interesting word. It's written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart. 
and upon the horns of your altars. What does God do with that blood that has sin in it? He puts a fingerprint of it on the horns of the altars so that there is a record of your sin. Now, when people say, oh, but God has forgotten it. Well, wait a minute. He says here, I have put it in a place where you'll, you can't get rid of it. I put it in your heart. I have engraved it in your heart. Now, I want to ask you a question. Please don't answer me. <laughs> don't raise your hands. Have you forgotten your sins that you confess to God? <laughs> Why not? Because he wrote them in your heart. Just like it says. When God makes a record of it on the horns of the altar, he also writes it into your heart and you have not forgotten Well, if you haven't forgotten, how in the world does God forget? I don't even understand that one, how people get over to the place where they think we can do something God can't do. <laughs> God hasn't forgotten. He didn't say any place he's going to forget. He says, I'm going to write it down. <laughs> we won't get into all the texts in the Bible that talk about books. <laughs> you know what books are for? They're for writing. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, keeping records. <laughs> Therefore, looking at. <laughs> the Bible is full of that. I don't know how people can miss all of those books. <laughs> but they do. I think theology has done that to them. They'd rather believe theologians than what the Bible says. All right. The sin is recorded. Because the sanctuary does not end right there at the blood. The plan of salvation does not end at the cross. The plan of salvation is just beginning according to God. Because you still have to go there to the labor. Then you have to go through the veil. You have to participate in the bread. You have to... Do the golden altar, you become the lampstand, and then there's another veil to go through into the most holy place. And inside there is the law of God. <laughs> so when we receive Jesus, we are Christians justified by faith through the merits of of Jesus alone. We had nothing to do with that justification except to believe in it and to receive it. But having received it, God gives something. Not only forgiveness. Forgiveness is no good if you don't get the rest of it. He gives not only forgiveness. He gives you himself. He says, I will come to live with you. Amen. He can't say that at the cross. That's where he died. He has to say it after the resurrection. <laughs> In Romans, it says much more than now that we are justified. We shall be saved. That's future tense. We shall be saved from wrath through him, the living Jesus. Salvation. The sacrifice was made at the cross. He earned the right to give it, but we don't have it until he's alive to give it to us. Well, he is alive. <laughs> there, are, there are people out there who sing it who I'm, not, I'm sure aren't picking up what they're really saying. He's alive. Where is he alive? <laughs> right here. That's where it counts, when he's alive in me. 
All of this is in the sanctuary. So that when I start over here, I'm just beginning once I enter. When I receive the benefits of the cross here, I'm beginning my walk. When I live in here in the holy place, I'm still not done. Or I have to go through another veil. The law is waiting for me. And the law wants to know. Are you obedient? <laughs> Are you loyal? Is God your father? Do you love his mind? Do you love the transcript of his character? Have you wanted to become like him? That's what the law is waiting. It's going to ask all those questions. If we were to go from here to there, we would have no hope. <laughs> God has shown us his plan. It has several steps. You know there are no steps if you say it all happened at the cross. <laughs> the cross is one event, a stupendous event. The most important event in, in the plan of salvation. That's the beginning that gets us in. But there are steps. Have you ever read that little book called Steps to Christ? <laughs> what an amazing title. <laughs> steps, not a one shot, I believe. <laughs> steps growing up into Christ that's one of the chapters you know well we're getting a good start on this now we're beginning to see the sanctuary really begins to open up things that we as Christians should know and it was there the whole time in that little picture <laughs> All of it is there. <laughs> it's amazing. What kind of a mind is that? <laughs> a mind that was so lovingly radical that Satan had no idea this is what was waiting. <laughs> he didn't know God was going to do this. You know, when Jesus came, the devil said, now I've got him. He said, now I've got him because he's not out there as God anymore. He's here as a man, and I have taken care of every man that ever existed. I got every one. And you know what he said? I'm going to do him the same way it always works. <laughs> I'm going to start. The opposite way from where God starts. God starts us as a being that worships. The devil starts on humans as animals. Yeah, he says, you're nothing but animals. That's where I'm going to start. What does he do? First thing he does, appetite. That's the first one. <laughs> Every human, that's where he goes. Yeah, you want something. I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> and you know he's never had to go past the first one with anybody <laughs> yeah the first one works <laughs> and he said now I've got him he put himself in the form of a human and he's not going to use his God powers for himself I've got him <laughs> And so he came to Jesus when he was hungry. <laughs> See? He waited until he was so weak he couldn't stand up anymore. And he came and he says, you know, you really look bad. I was sent down here to talk to God's son, but I don't think God would treat his son like this. <laughs> you are in bad shape. I've never seen anything like you. He said, but... But I was sent here, so, okay, I'll, I'll help you out. It's time for you to eat. I didn't bring any food with me, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but you're God's son, so you can make your own food. There's a rock, make some bread. Very casual. Just make some bread. 
<laughs> and Jesus caught the clues right away. He sure looks like an angel. He sounds like an angel, but he doesn't talk like one. He said, if you're the son of God, angels of God, don't say that. <laughs> So he knew who he was dealing with. And in the whole Bible, Jesus went to the one scripture. You don't need four or five if you know what you're looking for. He went to one scripture. Man does not live by bread alone. What did he say when he said that? He said, I would rather die of starvation than eat something my father didn't tell me to eat. Now the devil had never heard anybody else say that. <laughs> but Jesus said it, and you know who he said it for? <laughs> he said, what I have just said will be in everybody that comes to me for salvation. I'll put it in their heart that I'd rather die of starvation than eat something my father didn't put in my mouth. Amen. Why do you think we have a health message? <laughs> it's not to tell people they can't eat cheese or you should eat lettuce or peanut butter maybe or maybe not. God didn't make us a health reform for that reason. He wants us to participate in the victory of Jesus. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I'm waiting to hear from you, Father, to glorify you. Whatever I put in my mouth is for you. Isn't that a different way of looking at this? It's the Bible way. <laughs> the issue is not chocolate eclairs, <laughs> Twinkies. That's not the issue. We're supposed to be ready to die rather than offend our Father. And he has given us a lot of information that says, you know, this isn't good for you. <laughs> I want to protect you. I want to make you strong. I want you ready to have the freedom to witness to someone because you know you're not going against me. That's a real power, you know, when you can have the freedom to know that, you know, I am not fighting God. <laughs> a person who knows, well, that's not so important. <laughs> You better believe it's important because your conscience is bothering you. <laughs> and you cannot be an effective witness of God when your own conscience is telling you, how can I do this? <laughs> no, God knows how all that works. So he says, I'm going to cleanse you. We've taken the guilt away. You don't have guilt anymore in heaven. It's gone. But now I'm going to do something else. I'm not only going to cleanse heaven from what you did, I'm going to clean you. <laughs> I'm going to take that guilty conscience away from you. Yeah, Hebrews says he purges us of an evil conscience. He's go he says, I'm going to make it so that your mind no longer says to you, oh, I'm so bad. <laughs> yeah, here I am again. Oh, God can't do anything with me. He can save the world, but boy, he sure can't get through to me. God says, I'm going to take that away from you. I'm going to take it away through the blood of Jesus. He paid to take it away. And then I'm going to start working it out in you through a process that you indeed will become clean. You will become holy. You will become righteous. You'll become fit company for the angels in heaven. Yeah. The churches today have missed all of this. They don't think it's important to obey God. How horrible. Well, they're right about one thing. If we obey because of legalism, that's not going to do any good either. 
That's horrible too. We obey because we have his spirit and we love him. And we know that what he says to us is for our own good. <laughs> we trust him. So we need the path all the way from the beginning of that veil, all the way through, so that when we stand here in front of the law of God, and God lifts that mercy seat, that's what Luther called it, when he lifts that cover, and the law hits us in the face, <laughs> we're still going to be standing because the law is not going to find anything wrong with us. Jesus has made us commandment keepers. Do you think that's in the Bible for nothing? Here they are, the ones who keep the commandments of God. <laughs> it doesn't say here are they who tried and pretended. <laughs> it says here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. The reason we're going through this is not for entertainment. <laughs> we want to understand what God believes. We want to know what he believes so we can believe the same thing. Can you imagine the mess this world is in with all these different people teaching different things? They don't believe what God believes. They even believe things he hates. He calls it confusion, and I think that really is confusion. Babylon. <laughs> we shouldn't be confused. He has shown us through the sanctuary, through the history of the Hebrew people, through the prophecies, through the writings of the spirit of prophecy. And he has done everything he can do for us humans one day when we stand in front of him, what are we going to say? Well, I didn't understand. I didn't know anything about that. <laughs> He's going to say, well, I sent you my spirit. <laughs> I sent you Jesus. I sent you the angels. I sent you experiences. <laughs> You yourself said, boy, look how Adam blew it. How do you know that? <laughs> you know, he did not sin for you. You did your own. <laughs> yeah. Don't go blaming Adam. We're going to have nothing to say to God when he says, why? If we're in the place where he has to say that to us. Why? And we're going to know what it means then when the Spirit Prophecy says, there is no excuse for sin. Well, if there isn't any, uh, we, we can't think of one. <laughs> there isn't any. I'm going to close with a page that may make some sense to you now. Let's see. Desire of Ages, page 311. We're just getting started here, by the way. If you want to invite some of your friends, it's not too late to, to get them in on what the sanctuary teaches. All right, page 311. God's ideal for his children is higher than the human thought can think. So don't think your thoughts are high and you're saying, oh, I can never reach that. No, God's thoughts are much higher than that for you. <laughs> We're not reaching high enough yet. Be ye therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, you know who said that. 
<laughs> he would never tell us to do something we can't do. Now, his word for perfect means something more than we may understand, but we better not change the word. <laughs> Just our understanding. He says, as your father. Now, we're never going to be God, but God is perfect in a way that Jesus said he wants us to be. The father loves his children. And he says, you love people where you are. And you can't love people criticizing them and accusing them. Okay? Next sentence. This command is a promise. What a sentence. Oh, I'm glad that sentence is there. God just told me to be perfect. And if he said it, he means it. And then it says... It's, it's not just a command. It's a promise. He says, I'm going to see it gets done. It's going to happen. <laughs> That's what I need. <laughs> I need to know that when he says something, he means it. You will be. That's what he's saying. Not your way, but my way. That's what he's saying. <laughs> The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from Satan. How much? Complete. complete. Christ always. Oh, do you like these words? There's no give in it. Not one little teeny bit. Christ always separates the contrite soul from sin. Always. You can't do it, but he always does it to a believer. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And he has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul to keep him from sinning. Have you read this lately? <laughs> it's right down the middle of the most popular book we have Desire of Ages I read some of these words to one of the leaders of a movement out there and he said well if that's true <laughs> and I looked at him and said what do you mean if it's true <laughs> you're out there telling people how to be better Adventists how to be saved, and you say, if that's true. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I'm going out of the tape. I'm sorry. That's the way it goes. Over there in Genesis, you know the story about Abraham and a king, and the king likes what he sees in Sarah. She's a beautiful, beautiful woman in the